I'm Adam Grant. I'm here on the Wharton faculty and just absolutely thrilled to have a chance to introduce Shane Battier today. Uh, he's been one of my heroes since I was a kid. Uh, high school player of the I'm not, year. I'm not that old. All right, you were a kid then too, let's be fair. Uh, we're almost the same age, uh, but um, I've been watching him literally since he was playing uh, in high school in, in Michigan where, where I also grew up. And um, he was a national player of the year then, uh, of course Duke national champion, uh, player of the year, actually swept all those awards, then made it to the NBA. Uh, I know many of you have followed his career, but uh, really took off with the Rockets, part of a really successful team, major winning streak. Um, the thing that stuck out for me, though, is that Shane has actually won so many awards for sportsmanship that they actually had to set a rule that he's not allowed to win them anymore <laughs> uh, because it was just unfair to the rest of the competition. And um, I think many of you have read the Michael Lewis article on uh, the No Stats All-Star about how Shane was potentially the most unselfish player to ever play the game of basketball. Um, what I've enjoyed personally as I've learned about Shane is um, we have a lot in common. Um, in addition to growing up in Michigan, uh, we were both told that we would never make it in the NBA. Uh, <laughs> I was told it in seventh grade, though. <laughs> and uh, he was kind enough to recommend his barber to me, so thanks for that. Uh, so I think there's, there's a lot of ground that we could cover here, but the, the place we really wanted to start is to say that, that Shane was the guy who really, really took statistics and brought them into basketball uh, to change the way that he played the game. And the Michael Lewis article starts with this incredible story of him guarding Kobe Bryant. So Shane, could you tell us a little bit about what you did to prepare to defend Kobe Bryant? <laughs> well, first of all, I started out with a, a, a prayer session. Uh, so name, name your God. I, I probably prayed, uh, prayed, prayed to that God. Um, you know, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. I'm an, I'm an old uh, retired MBA fart now. Um, so this is my way of, uh, uh, my wife says, go out and be productive. This is my way of uh, being productive to society. But thank you for having me. And um, uh, sports analytics uh, uh, became a part of my life in the NBA. And I was very lucky. Uh, five years into my career, I got traded to uh, from the, the Memphis Grizzlies to the Houston Rockets. And the Houston Rockets, for those who don't know, are really the first pro organization of basketball, at least, to embrace uh, the analytics movement. And they hired a, a man by the name of Daryl Morey, one of the smartest guys I know. And he totally embraced big data in terms of, of uh, shaping the thought and, and the, the journey of, of the organization. And uh, uh, lucky for me, uh, Whatever algorithms Daryl came up with, his, came up with his, in his computer uh, spit out my name. And so he, uh, on draft day of, of 2006, he made a very controversial trade. He traded uh, the rights to the seventh pick in the draft, which is Rudy Gay, this 6'8", long, athletic guy who just, like, just oozed, just passes the eye test. Uh, um, and the whole city of Houston was drooling over. Well, they, when they announced the trade for me on draft night, they it was the first draft party ever where there were, there were booze. Uh, if I would have been there, people would have thrown tomatoes at me. And so that's what I was going into. And, and Daryl uh, uh, brought me in and he said, look, uh, you've been a winner in your entire, your, your entire career. And although you probably don't know it, you affect the game in so many ways um, that like no one, essentially, but us, <laughs> under, understand your value to this team. And we know that you're going to raise our whole organization to a higher level. And so I said, all right, you're, you're the man. And so uh, it was nice to hear that. It was nice to hear that. And so uh, Daryl really educated me on uh, sort of the new wave uh, money ball theory as it pertains to basketball. And I realized uh, early on in the conversation, this is really, really good stuff, stuff that I had never been talked to about, I was, wasn't familiar with. Uh, but I realized once I started to uh, implement sort of money ba basketball in, in games, it would work. I'd go, talking about Kobe Bryant, Kobe was, was my ultimate foil professionally. My rookie year, I learned what it meant to be on Kobe Island. All right, here I come from Duke University, full of confidence and vigor. Duke University, we won 131 games, lost 15, which is a record, still is a record for a four-year period. I go to the Memphis Grizzlies, uh, who drafted me sixth, and they had the lowest winning percentage out of any pro professional sports team in North, Amer North America. So literally, I went from the best to the worst ever. And my rookie year, we played Kobe. And I learned uh, what Kobe Island meant very soon. Uh, 
when you're in a bad basketball team, the hallmark of that is a lack of help defense. You don't play team defense. And so when I was guarding Kobe Bryant on a, on a warm January night in LA, I'm, I said, I got Kobe, I got him. And I would turn around and there'd be no one behind me. <laughs> I got him. Kobe Bryant proceeds to light me up for 56 points in three quarters. <laughs> we were so bad, Phil Jackson sat him, he didn't even play in the fourth quarter. So he scored, he scored 70 points in the game, he would have blown way past that if he would have played in the fourth quarter. So that was my introduction to Kobe Bryant. And so I, I, I said to myself, I gotta figure out a way to guard this guy. Uh, luckily, Daryl gave me the tools. And the way Daryl and Sam Hinkie, who's now the, the, the GM of the, the 76, there's much maligned, Sam's my guy, I love him. He's got a plan. Um, <laughs> We're still waiting. Yeah, I, well, it's, it might be a minute. It might be a minute. Uh, the way they inter introduced analytics to me is they said, you know, you, you like to go to Vegas. You like to play blackjack. I said, yeah. You know, there, there's a book on how to maximize your opportunity in, in blackjack, isn't there? I said, yeah. You know, that was an analogy that, that hit home to me. Well, we're going to show you the book on Kobe Bryant. And we're going to tell you everything you need to know on how to give, your, give yourself the best chance of survival against Kobe Bryant. And so it started a process um, where I beca it became a habit for me to get a data packet, about, about four or five pages, six pages, on, on every player on every team the night before I started to play them. And it became my habit of learning the ins and outs. And instead of relying on the old eyeball test, instead of relying on some, some crusty old professional basketball scout saying, you know what, Kobe's got a really good right hand. Look out for it. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> we, and we, we pay you for this. Yes, it's great. Thanks. I knew to a T that when Kobe Bryant drives right and gets into the painted area and shoots, he shoots at a 63% clip. If I force him left and I make him shoot a non-painted area jump shot, he's only going to shoot 44%. So, duh, well, what do I choose? Just like playing blackjack, you don't double down when you get a 15, right? So, it became a habit to isolate my best case scenario and my worst case scenario against every player I would ever play against or match up against on the floor, be it a center, be it a guard. Um, when you're guarding a guy like Kobe, uh, there's a lot more uh, repetitions, a lot more chances to actually have the, the numbers play out. <laughs> As, uh, as I learned the hard way, uh, but uh, it, it gave me an unbelievable uh, uh, real-world trial on, you know what, do these numbers play out? Do these numbers play out? And so, uh, luckily, um, Kobe is my favorite competitor of all time. No one played, played me tougher, and no one gave me more looks of disdain and Kobe Bryant, and I can only imagine what was going through his mind. There's no way this Battier chump, a guy who's slow, can't jump, unathletic, no way he can, he, can, he can even be on the court with me. Well, over time, uh, I started to drain his efficiencies, and drain his efficiencies, and drain, drain his efficiencies. And I finally had my, my Mona Lisa for Kobe. Uh, I was playing in Houston. We had uh, a team that had the second longest winning streak in NBA history. All right, we were not very, we were like the, the eighth seed in, in the Western Conference playoff. This was the most organic, lightning, in, lightning in, a, in a bottle streak. No one could explain it. How in the heck are these, the little engine that could, how have they won 22 straight, 21 straight games in a row, only trailing the, the legendary Laker team? Well, here comes Kobe Bryant in game 22. And I can just tell by his look that he was here to end the streak personally. All this mumbo jumbo, about the Rockets and, and Battier. This is after the Michael Lewis article came out. And so I knew he was out for bear. And um, it was, I knew it was my ultimate test to put the numbers to work. And so I went to work, I went to work, I forced him left, I forced him left, I forced him left, I forced him left, I forced him left. I didn't give him anything that he wanted to do. And at the end of the game, Kobe shoots 11 for 33, 33%, which is way, way, way below his season average and he only scores uh, 20, 24 points. In basketball, if you, if you score less than the amount of shots you've, you've taken, um, that's a good day for the defense. And uh, I could just see him storm off the court 
dejected. And in, the, in the locker room afterwards, when they asked him, you know, was it Shane's defense? No, 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 it was just an off night. And that, <laughs> that's okay. That's okay by me that he never gave me the credit. You know, I love, I love him anyways. But, um, you know, for me, it, it was the ultimate in, in teaching and proving to myself that it really is about process. It's not about results. I've, I had the results, and some were good, some were, some were poor. But over a long period of time, when I introduced the analytics into my game, into my, my defensive game plan, I saw the fruits of the labor. And so um, I had an amazing coach named Jeff Van Gundy who explained uh, a simple game plan. He said, don't fail the plan, let the plan fail you, which is pretty good. He said, don't make it up, don't freestyle, just ask, just do what I ask you to do. And if it doesn't work, it's on me. I'll never lambast you in the media. I won't call you out because you, you, you stay with the plan. And so with the numbers, I had the same theory. Just follow the numbers. Follow what the numbers are telling you, just like playing blackjack in Vegas, and they will win out. And, uh, and I have some pretty good Kobe stories to prove it. So one of the things that, that very few of us in the room have experienced that you got to live was incorporating these data into visceral, intuitive, moment-to-moment -moment decisions. Yeah. Um, I think what most of us do is we get to sit down, we crunch numbers for a few months, and then we think and we make a decision. Yeah. You had to do this in real time. <laughs> um, yeah. How did it change your game to be so aware of analytics? Well, like I said, it, it was a habit. It, it didn't come naturally. It didn't come easy because I, it was a totally different way of thinking about the game of basketball, a game that I, I had been playing since I was five years old. And NBA basketball is difficult enough, all right? Just trying to survive and, and try, <laughs> trying to make a few baskets and stop your man. So all of a sudden, I have a Carmelo Anthony coming at me full speed, one-on-one -on -one in full court, and in a, in a millisecond, I have to determine, okay, what's Carmelo's weakness? What's, what's his best case scenario? What's my best case scenario? And execute it in a flash. Uh, but that was a habit I developed over a long, long, long time where I didn't, it became instinctual. I knew that when, when Carmelo Anthony caught the ball on the left block, I knew that he wanted to dip his right shoulder, use his left hand, and go to the basket. So, of course, what did I do? Almost instinctually, as soon as he caught it, I would jump on, on that shoulder, make him go the other way. Um, and so, it, we talked about this earlier today. Uh, that's probably the, the, the biggest complaint I hear from, from teammates. Like, I can't, I can't think that fast. I can't, I can't think that fast. And in basketball, I think that so many players and coaches and GMs and owners and, and fans get overwhelmed by the term analytics and big data and its role. And there's so many people who are worried that it's taking over sports, it's taking the enjoyment, sucking the enjoyment out of sports. And I always point back to uh, when I... You know, I'm taking credit for this. I introduced LeBron James to analytics, all right? We're the world's greatest player of all time. Yeah, I think he's the greatest, the greatest alive, might be the greatest of all time. Um, you know, how dare I suggest to LeBron James, the baddest mamba jam on the block, how to play the game of basketball, all right? But LeBron, I was lucky because, first of all, he was a tremendous teammate. Uh, but secondly, he, he had an open mind about always looking to get better. And, and so, after gaining his trust, I think the first time I talked to him, I said, look, I have all these numbers on these players. I know exactly what their strength is, what their weakness is. You know, forget this old scouting report that says Kevin Durant's really good. Yeah, no, <laughs> duh. Uh, I can tell you how good he is in every facet of the game. And so, I said, you know what, tonight, on this, on this night, when Kevin Durant catches the ball in the low post, he wants to go and shoot over this right shoulder, do a turnaround jumper over this right shoulder. And it's tonight, you know what? Just try it. Just humor me. Make him shoot over this shoulder. And I told him the justification why that he's 20% better over this shoulder than he is shooting over this shoulder. And I broke it down. I said, you know, you do that in a one-on-one -on -one game where he gets 50 possessions and you make him shoot over left shoulder versus shooting over the right shoulder, guess how many points you're going to save? You know, it was like 12, you know, 12, 13 points. He got that. He got that. 
he, he understood when, you, when, you, when I broke it down in, in a relative term, something that, um, you know, coaches always yell at their players at, hey, get a hand in his face. Well, getting a hand in the shooter's face when he takes a shot, what does that do? That's a contest. And there's, there's data now that proves that a contested shot is better than an open jump shot. Uh, and so it's funny how in basketball, a lot of the old school teachings um, actually have very valid scientific data to, 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 to back it up. But you have to break it down in those bite-sized chunk and a, a, rela a, relatable, um, a relatable piece of, 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 of tidbit of advice for people to digest it. But once LeBron did that in the game and it was successful and, and we beat the, the Thunder that night, um, you know, I think LeBron was hooked. And so, and I knew that, next time we, we had a game, he said, hey, what do you think about this guy? Now, you know, I was trying to protect his swag. You know, I, I, you know he didn't want <laughs> to, to, to broadcast the world. He's asking me for advice. But uh, we would actually have really good uh, discussions as to who a player actually was, his strengths, his weaknesses, uh, a game plan. And, um, you know, I think I, I helped make LeBron James that much better. So that, that actually speaks to one of the things that we wanted to talk about, which is communicating analytics to people who don't necessarily get it. Um, I love the idea of saying, hey, instead of, you know, you need to do this, just, just try it. Let me know what happens. Um, but you mentioned that LeBron was somebody who was really hungry to improve. How do you pitch this to somebody who's more skeptical and thinks statistics are a waste of time? First of all, you better know your stuff. You better know your stuff um, inside and outside. Your actions have to match up with your, with your words. And that was uh, the number one thing. My, whenever, whenever I walked into the locker room, my teammates always, always saw me with the scouting report with nothing but numbers. And that was, you know, they, they laughed at me. Oh, Shane in his numbers, Shane in his numbers. You know, on the bus, before the game, I always have my information packet. I was asking, I was asking my um, sports information director, I need more, give me more, give me more, give me more. And so I walked the walk. And so when I talk the talk and I would say, you know, Coach Spo, we're defending this guy all wrong. The numbers say this. First of all, guys would be like, well, yeah, Shane knows. He studies. He studies. Um, and so, you know, just like, it's just like getting someone to play hard. You can't go in and say, you know, you got to play hard. You're not playing hard enough. You got to earn their trust. You have to show them what you're about. You have to show them that you're, you're pure of heart and that your motives are aligned. And for basketball, it's easy. There's a scoreboard every single night, and the, the, the motive is to win. And when you win, look, everybody goes uptown. I, I tell people that no one's ever asked me how many points I scored in the 2001 national championship game. No one's asked me how many, how many points did you score in game seven of, of the NBA finals in 2013, 18, by the way. <laughs> I know that because it was, it was pretty awesome. <laughs> they ask it, all they ask me is, hey, where do you keep your rings? Let me see your rings. How do you decide what rings you're on? And so my teammates always knew that I was, I was pure of heart and I was willing to sacrifice my limelight for the sacrifice of the team. And the way that I could improve the team for me was through the analytics. And so, um, you know, the skeptics, a guy like Dwayne Wade who didn't believe in the numbers at all, I backed off my approach. But there's still times when I knew that what I had to offer would be able to help him. And so I was a little less overt in my advice, but maybe he'd be struggling in a matchup one time and he'd come to the bench and I'd say, hey, 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 don't, don't let that guy go right. And that was enough. And because I had the credibility, the credence, uh, I, I felt that they listened. Mm -hmm. So you, you just had something else we want to make sure we surface, which is um, identifying people who are, are actually unselfish and are willing to put the team's interests above their own. Um, in a drafting context, in a hiring selection context, how do we spot more Shane Battiers? What, what behaviors, what habits would you look for? Adam, if I had the answer to that, I. <laughs> I don't know if we'd be talking right now. <laughs> so we understand that, that Google is working on a human cloning project right now. So maybe, maybe <laughs> exactly. Um, 
that's, that's, an excellent, uh, that's an excellent question. See, look, I, I didn't start out this journey by saying, you know, I want to I be a multiple championship player. I want to have all these stats. I want to have all these accolades. No. I, the reason why I played basketball is, and wanted to, to compete at a high level is the same reason I played kickball in first grade. I wanted to win. And I realized when I was in first grade, that when I was on winning kickball teams, winning dodgeball teams, winning basketball teams, and I had a role in winning those games, people liked me. <laughs> I was more popular. People wanted to be around me. You know, that's, that's pretty primal stuff for, for a, a six, seven year old, right? But it's, but it's no different. And so uh, whether it was my, my social studies group in school, whether it was my community service group, whether it was my baseball team, my basketball team, whether it was my family, whether it was my friends, it's about making the group succeed. Succeed. And there's one thing that, that people are very, very good at, all right? They may not be the best at finding solutions, but they can always spot a problem. I think that's a, that's a universal skill. People are excellent <laughs> at, uh, but it's, it's, it's needed at identifying problems, identifying what won't work, identifying people who don't have it. Well, there's some slicksters out there that can, can fool the masses. But for the most part, if you have a, a flaw, phony, I got you. But on the flip side, and I don't know how people can, uh, can describe it, but there are people that are, no matter what group they're in, what setting they're in, you say, you know what, there's something about that young lady. She's a winner. She's a winner. I'm, I'm lucky to play in the, in the age of analytics, so now there's stats to back up things that would have been described as being a, a glue player or a grit guy or a hustler if I would have played 20 years ago. So now people can say, you know, hey, Shane's VORP is, is amazing and, and, and different stats like that, which, you know, that's cool by me. I can <laughs> make a nice career out of that. Uh, but Finding people that have serial success, um, I think, is, is, the next, is the next step in, in all walks of life. In, in basketball and in sports, it's, I think, a little easier because the scoreboard is, is, is eminent. It's there every single night. There's a winner, there's a, there's a loser. I know immediately how I perform, performed, if I was weak, if I was strong, if I was uh, playing above my head. Um, but that's, that's the exciting part of, of analytics, drilling down and finding what people have traditionally called heart, determination, grit, perseverance, and, and being able to, to quantify that in some, in some manner. So especially recently during your time on ESPN, uh, you had a chance to think about the holes and spot your problems of your own. What's on your wish list for statistics that we don't currently track but should be? Um, I would love to measure how people handle pressure. I think that's what makes people truly great. I've, I play with some, some unbelievable players, Hall of Fame players. And like I said, a guy like LeBron James, a guy like Ray Allen, a guy like Dwayne Wade, they delivered when it was the most clutch. You know, I know clutch is a, is a big argument in sports. Does, does clutch exist? But I do believe there is something that is, that is deep inside you that separates the people that are able to perform and think clearly or, or think even more clearly when the stakes are the highest. And uh, that's something that I, I prided myself on my entire career. I wasn't the fastest guy, the slowest guy, wasn't the best looking guy. I'm supposed to laugh at that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hello, hello, hello. Is this is on. Uh, but one thing I always prided myself on was, was being able to perform and think when the pressure is the highest in, in every situation of my, of my life. And that's something that uh, I'm excited about learning how to, how to isolate that. So given all you know about analytics, you're going to coach a team. What do you, what do, you do? <laughs> oh, well, if, if I coach, that's a big if. Um, I don't know if I have the patience. I know how hard I worked, and if I didn't get that from my team, I, I would struggle. So that being uh, said, but, but, when you but, coach. But with basketball, I would, I would play the most exciting, fun way. I'm a, I'm a defensive guy, all right? I was two-time 
all defensive team in the in the NBA. My, you know, I I basically stayed in the league for a long time because I was a very good defender and a very good uh, shooter. Um, but I would totally go outside the box. And if I were a, a basketball coach, I would play like a track meet. I would try to shoot 40 to 50 three point shots every single game. I would play 12 guys every single night and I would try to go outside the box and maximize the efficiencies of nothing but three-pointers and layups um, on steroids. Um, I would make it an exciting <laughs> brand of basketball to watch, to play. I think people would enjoy it. And I would just, I would dare somebody to try to match our style. And I think that would, uh, there are people trying to do that, uh, but I'd be all in. How much do you like the 76ers? <laughs> um, you know, they, they're, a, they're a couple years away. They're a couple years away. Uh, they have some intriguing talent. Um, look, the, the, key, the key to winning is not a, not a secret. I had a coach named Hubie Brown, who's one of the smartest basketball minds in, in the world, he was talking about analytics before analytics became in vogue. And he's about uh, 80 years old now, and he's, he's given conferences all around the, the world for his basketball knowledge. And the first thing he says to coaches, he says, all right, I'm going to teach you from, from uh, Jersey. I'm going to teach you the most important thing about basketball. Listen up. So first thing in the, in the media, so all the coaches lean in, goes over to the overhead projector and says, if you do not have good players, you will not win. <laughs> <laughs> Let me repeat that, Jack. You may have missed it. If you do not have good players, you will not win. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> So we, we can't all have good players all the time, right? So um, can you talk to us about how you've compensated for your, your own deficits in skill and, and what all of us can learn from that when we're managing imperfect talent? Yeah. Um, know thy strengths. Know thy strengths, know thy weaknesses. And try to stay away from the weaknesses <laughs> and surround yourself with people that, uh, that can compensate. Look, I wasn't the fastest guy in, in the world. Um, but there were, there were things that are out of my control, and I think that's what I realized at an early, early age. But there were some things that I, could, I, I controlled every single day, and I tried to control it uh, to, to the max. My attitude, my behavior, my energy. Uh, if, I was, if I wasn't going to make it, and I always thought I was going to make it, it wasn't going to be because of my lack of attitude, my lack of ethic, my habits and my energy. I brought it every single day, and I dared people to match, match me on those levels. You know, because in, in, in a team setting, the most powerful force is peer pressure. It's peer pressure. And you can have the world's greatest coach, but if that locker room has a culture that people don't want to buy into, um, it's not going to work. You know, when you, when you have a bunch of talented people that uh, who stay late, put in extra work, who care for team, who cheer for each other, who uh, don't make excuses, who are honest, all, and all of a sudden you're that jerk that doesn't do those things, guess what, you're on the outside real quick. And on the other token, if you have a, a culture of dishonesty and, and lack of integrity and, and laziness, all of a sudden you want to go against that, guess what, you're an outlier. Um, and so uh, I always try to challenge in a, in a nonverbal way to people to get to my level on the things I control, attitude, behavior, integrity, honesty, work. You said something fascinating earlier um, when we were speaking about how you actually knew too much at one point about your own yeah. strengths and weaknesses. What, what happened as, as you knew your own data so well? Well, I, I tried not to look at my own data because I felt that that would make me a less instinctual player. And so, although I knew every stat, every analytic on the guys I was guarding, I, I, I'm not looking, I'm not looking, I'm not looking when it came to my own numbers. Uh, because I am a person that is, is almost over-rational. And uh, it came to a point my last two years in the NBA, the, there's been a lot of data and a lot of articles written about the worst shot in basketball. That's the two-point dribble jump shot outside the painted area. I made one my last two years. One. You know how hard that is to do? When I told people that, they're like, no way. Come on. You can't do that. But I knew that I could never make that shot at a high enough rate to justify 
taking that shot. And so as a result, rationally, I became a very calculated player. And I think it did hurt my creativity uh, on the offensive end. Defensively, it's a different mindset. And so I thought it, 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 it elevated my, my game to a higher level. Offensively, it hurt my, it hurt my creativity and my enjoyment. I, I didn't play as free, and that's why basketball is the greatest sport in the world, because of the freedom. Um, and so there, there was a danger to, to knowing how the sausages are made. Um, <laughs> but with that said, I, I wouldn't trade my journey for anything. Knowing, knowing now, what I, what I knowing, if I'd have known what I know now, I would have shot the ball a heck of a lot more. Uh, but uh, uh, my journey through analytics and basketball raised me to a, a, a higher plane. As we close, uh, we're, I know we're all curious to know what are you doing now with the Batty H.A. Charge Foundation and what role could analytics play in your work moving forward? Yeah, well now that I'm, uh, I'm out of basketball, I'm looking for things to fill my, my time. Uh, my wife and I started the Batty H.A. Charge Foundation. Uh, we feel very strongly about education and we award college scholarships to low-income, low at-risk youth. And um, I don't know, if, if you Google Batty Oki, all right, Google it, you're, you're in for a treat. That's our big fundraiser. So imagine LeBron James and uh, Jimmy Buffett and uh, uh, who else do we have? John Cicada this year singing karaoke. John Cicada and I sang a karaoke for kids this year. It was amazing. And last year it was Ken Jeong, Greg Oden, and myself uh, singing karaoke, but that's neither here nor there. But uh, we're, we're a very small um, foundation. We're just three members, my wife, our executive director, and myself. And, uh, we've, gr we've grinded hard to be where we are. We've, we have 13 kids in our program, graduated four. Uh, but I, I'm fascinated in, in utilizing technology and specifically analytics to, to grow our mission. And that, that's the way that we can level the playing field against the bigger found, uh, foundations out there that we're, we're buying for their, their dollar as well. Um, trying to uh, isolate, you know, what, what makes donors identify with us and how do we grow our donor pool and how do we maximize our our time and, and energy uh, efficiencies through analytics and uh, there's some smart people if anyone has the answer I'm all ears I'm all I'm all ears in here but it, it's exciting time for uh, now that I have time to devote to my, my foundation full-time it's exciting to see the possibilities and uh, leveraging technology and analytics is, is it's pretty fun we, we really appreciate you being willing to come here, and I think it speaks volumes that uh, it took you exactly eight minutes to say yes after the invitation came in. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Shane.